When they met, Leonard Lake and Charles Ng both had strong ideas about the world. Both of them had abandonment issues. One was dominant and the other one was a follower. Once they realize how their ideologies collide, they'll want to combine their strengths in order to do the most damage possible. This is the story of Leonard Lake and Charles Ng. I told the girl in the back, who is quite literally, as you know by now, my inner thoughts, that I have a couple of things to address on the agenda before diving into the story. You can always skip to the next timestamp if you don't care about that. But yeah, she's going to ask me a couple of questions now, as if this was a late night show interview. Yes, go ahead, girl in the back. What are your thoughts on this book title? Right. Right in the meat, right in the nutshell. I hate this book title as much as I like this book. That is the summary of that. Like, it is a pretty decent book, but I almost haven't read it. And it's like the only book written on this case. I almost have not read it because of that title. The title of it will be clarified in part two because you guessed it, because I just said it, and because you see it in the title. The story of Leonard Lake and Charles Ng will be a two-parter. It makes the most sense. It will be too long for it to be one parter, and it makes most sense to split it on a cliffhanger and to split it when you finally try to at least understand the two individuals. So that's how it's split, okay? Yeah, the girl in the back has another question. Can you tell us a bit more about why we are here? Why this particular story? I truly feel like I'm part of some late night show that somebody gives a fuck, even though this is totally scripted and the girl in the back totally does not exist, which makes me 100% hinged, okay? I am a hinged person. All right. <laughs> Where was I? This is a listener suggestion, so thank you. And let it not repeat itself, okay? Just kidding. <laughs> I live for this shit. This story affected me on so many levels, as we are gonna speak about throughout the video. But yes, there is a case suggestion form, and you can also drop any like recommendations in the comments, and I will add them to my list. And the main reason why that person wanted me to cover this case, and why I wanted to cover these particular individuals, is because I think we have a particular thought of thinking when you think about a killer duo that aren't like siblings, or aren't people that have known each other forever. I feel we kind of think like the two individuals just meet, one of them suggests the idea and the other one is like, yeah, I'm on board, let's kill some people together. And this story is a really great example about how incorrect that assumption is. And it's gonna break those myths. If that is your thought process going into this story, this story will change your opinion on that. So stick around to find out exactly what I'm talking about. I think we have just about enough time for one last question. Is there anything else that you would like to plug? I got carried away there. I'm not like plugging a movie or a book or anything else. I just wanted to brief you on the agenda because if everything, knock on wood, goes well, I'm gonna have the first holiday in about two years. Yeah, not about two years, in over two years. Bye. I'm hopefully gonna go on holiday next week, gonna go back home for a week, calm my tits, but do not despair, okay? You're gonna have one video a week, that was the only briefing that I have had. So this week you're having part one of Leonard Lake and Charles Ng, next week it's gonna be part two, I'm gonna try to release it on like Monday and Tuesday, so there's no long wait on that. And then a week later I am redoing... <laughs> The case that is probably the longest case on my podcast and the one that still lives here in my head rent-free because truly this case is, is one of a kind. It's one case that will make you rethink everything you know about true crimes. So yeah, that's gonna be another long one. So it'll be like one case each week and then I'm coming back. But what I wanted to show you is that on my holiday, of course, because I don't understand the concept of holidays without like true crime, um, I'm gonna be reading this book, don't reveal the title, look, look at the thickness of it. <laughs> it's like a freaking Bible. It's not an actual Bible. Imagine if I came back from holiday and I was like, you know, let me tell you a story about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Little baby, Jesus Christo, he gone bad, gone bad. Jesus turned bad. It's all fun and games, but the older I get, the more uncomfortable I am with not being able to, like, picture and visualize where we come from. This is getting... this is going sideways. We have lived 10 lives in the past 10 minutes. But you know what I mean, like, religious or not, 
Like, can you actually visualize a plausible explanation of why we are here? It is a story for a different time. It's not a Bible. It is a decent true crime book that I'm going to be reading and then telling you the week after I come back from holiday. So I just wanted to brief you on the agenda. And now let's get into this story. It's been like 15 minutes. Maya, god damn it. Maya is the name. Gone Bad is the game. It is the series where I sit on my fat ass and I tell you a story about people that have lived normal lives until one day decided to flip a switch, switch to crime. And today's topic is a killer duo, Leonard Lake and Charles Ng. Let us dive into this precious story that will totally not traumatize you for life. Oh yeah, disclaimer, <laughs> because there's a disclaimer needed. Not so much for part one of this video, but YouTube is a bit weird about this topic, so hey, YouTube audit people, monitors, whatever your actual job titles are, I'm not gonna be putting any footage into these videos, okay? Don't ban me online. I worked hard on this. I read a whole ass book of like 500 pages, okay? Don't, don't, don't push it. <laughs> Let me tell people about the psychology of these people. But the viewer discretion is advised because adult topics are ahead, especially in the second part, but in this one as well. They're not the most stable individuals. So if you're a child, get the hell out of there. It shouldn't be on your recommended page anyways because serial killers, but you know. If you're a child, don't get traumatized like this. <laughs> this is the weirdest disclaimer. This isn't how disclaimers are done at all. Let us dive into this story, goddammit, Maya. Get it together. 100% hinged. Mm, that's what she said. 100% hinged. Our story today starts right after the Second World War in San Francisco. This is when, in 1945, 21-year-old U.S. Navy sailor Elgin Lake and his wife Gloria decided it is the right time for the birth of their first child. So, around the most romantic time of the year, on Valentine's Day, his parents decided to do it, and on October the 29th, 1945, Leonard Lake was born. I'm gonna need to pause here for a second, because serial killers, first of all, stop being born. That could be where the sentence ended, really. But really, stop being born on my exact birth date. That played my head. That messed me up. That messed me up this whole story that was in the back of my head. I was like, okay, no, I can see how he's living this life this way. No. On my exact birthday. I mean, of course, that he's gonna be a sexual deviant, because every single Scorpio that you think about when it comes to serial killers truly is. Charles Manson, manipulator, and a sexual deviant. Toy box killer, same. Gingling nanny, same. Pretty much. Anybody that you can think of that is complete sexual deviant and just evil, manipulative piece of shit, born in October or November, Scorpio, season, fuck it. And it's just the lamest because you know your parents had sex on Valentine's Day and that's why you came to this world and you're like, I hate everything, I hate life. So stop being born and stop being born as a Scorpio. That is crucial. Crucial that you understand this. All right, let's move on with this story. <laughs> Gloria and Eglin would soon have a daughter called Sylvia and then Leonard's youngest brother called Donald. Now, the economic conditions weren't great. The family was living in what is known as the projects, so sort of like council houses, and they just weren't well off. They were actually pretty poor, to the point that actually his dad... Leonard's dad decided to move and leave the family behind. So he moved to Seattle. He moved to Washington. And now Gloria had a dilemma somehow. I don't know how she had this dilemma, but she did, okay? So her dilemma was, well, Leonard was in kindergarten at this point. So she felt, okay, he's grown enough. Let me actually try to go back to Eglin, like, go to Seattle, try to, like, revive this marriage, this relationship, even though he abandoned me and three other children. Let me try to revive this, but also it might not work. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take Sylvia and Donald here and leave Leonard behind in kindergarten with my grandparents to live and he'll be he'll be fine with it because what if it doesn't work and then like I move this child you know from schooling etc to Seattle Washington for nothing yeah that's going to make any child especially little budding serial killer like Leonard Lake here feel really accepted by his family like really loved 
It's totally not gonna give him all of the abandonment issues that are gonna start ensuing from this point on. Also, according to the book, Gloria did ask Leonard if he wants to go. But of course, Leonard is a freaking child. He's in kindergarten. He apparently said no, and she was like, okay, cool. He doesn't want to go. And then at the train station, he figured out that his mom is abandoning him with his two other siblings, and he started crying and sobbing. But it was too late, because she only got enough tickets for the three of them. So Leonard, from this point on, was living with his grandparents. And he was actually doing a lot better off, because now the grandparents were only taking care of one child. So they were never well off by any means, but Leonard had his own room. He even had an allowance. He was going to all of the summer camps, all of the school trips. So he was doing pretty okay with his grandparents. That's it. End of the story. Perfect. What went wrong? A couple of things. Just like it happens with actually plenty of serial killers, the one that pops into my head right now is Richard Ramirez and his cousin Miguel. Actually, in this story, both Leonard and Charles later will have a cousin that kind of left an impression on them. Interestingly, though, if you are unaware of Richard Ramirez's story, and also I'm not sure why I'm aware, because I listen to this kind of shit all the time, because I never covered it on this channel, here it was in reverse. In Richard Ramirez's story, the cousin was a bit of a sociopath. In, if I remember right, he actually killed a person, like his wife or somebody, in front of young Richard, so of course that's going to leave an impression in young child's mind. Here, it was a bit in reverse. Chester, Leonard's cousin, was about nine years older than him, but he's the one that will later tell of Leonard's odd behavior as a child. It was more like Chester was an impressionable one because of how Leonard was reacting from a really young age. Chester will remember Leonard having this chemistry lab where he would conduct experiments, and then he would invite Chester to see, like, how cool it is. And at first, it was all just, like, experimenting with different chemicals, because this was different times. Little kids had access to that, apparently, or he would just sneak it from school. And at one occasion, he even set, like, half of his room on fire, but they managed to extinguish it in time, so there wasn't much damage done to the room. But then Leonard went a couple of steps further. He started collecting mice. So he would make this world for these mice. Like, he would get them to live in, like, certain confined spaces, in, like, their houses. He would make, like, activities in his room and garage for the mice, like these little mazes and spaces for them to just move around so that they stick around and stay with him. But then there was time to get rid of these mice, and that is when his chemistry lab proves useful again. Chester would later say that Leonard would just drop these mice into acid. Like, this wouldn't be a slow death. And he would then just look at these mice dissolve in this acid, dying a slow, painful death for hours. One other interest that Leonard developed was photography. So, his mom, Gloria, right, she moved to Washington, she started having a relationship again with the dad, with Elgin, with his two children, but then she realized uh, it failed. But she still stayed there and remarried and now had two other kids, two other daughters. And every time they would come and visit, well, Leonard would be around practicing photography because he just got this camera as a present. And he, of course, without consent, would just be snapping pictures and videos of these two stepsisters that he had. No family members see this chemistry lab, him dissolving mice and creating the world for the mice, him taking pictures of his half-naked stepsisters without consent. Nobody sees any of this as a red flag. And they won't see this next thing as a red flag either. So remember how Leonard had younger brother Donald? Donald was actually in some serious car accident that left him not disabled, 
but he has had head injuries that left him a little slow. So, due to this, he started receiving benefits. Social Security, I'm not sure what you call them in the US. But yeah, he started receiving benefits from the government. And Leonard, and this is crucial for him throughout his whole life, will see Donald from that point on as a leech. He will see him as the worst of the society, like the definition of what is wrong with our society. Because it's those people that don't do anything with their lives, they just live off of social benefits. He just never saw that, no, this brother of his is in such a debilitating condition that he actually can't work. This is why he's receiving them. He never processed that part of it. And from this point on, this is how Leonard Lake will continue to see the world. He would say these types of people took from the system and they should be punished. He even, according to his half-sister Janet, would later say that if he could poison a water supply of everyone on welfare, he would do it. Just as he was around the age of 18, in 1963, this book called The Collector came out. It was a book written by this English author, John Fowles, and it follows this guy who at first collects butterflies, but then suddenly focuses on this woman, starts stalking her on the street, and decides to kidnap this woman called Miranda and keep her in his house as a sex slave. Once he read this book, Leonard started mentally picturing a beautiful young woman enslaved, kept in a secret cell, just subject to his own control under her, where he would be a dominant and this woman would be a submissive, available whenever he wanted her, and being completely under his spell. He was fine living with his grandparents at this point, but now, having read this book and this plot being so fresh in his mind, he decides to move on. He wants to emancipate. He wants to go out and live in this world by himself. So, a couple of months after his 18th birthday, in 1964, he enrolls into Marine Corps. He loved being in the Marines. He loved it in particular because he was learning how to use the weapons. He was in this camouflaged uniform. He felt like he was on to something secretive, like he was being trained towards some further purpose. And on the weekends, while at his job, he would be visiting South Carolina, which is where his family lived now. And here he met Karen. Karen was a daughter of one of his uncle's friends, and immediately there was some attraction between Leonard and Karen. In 1966, Leonard was assigned for duty in California, so he started corresponding with Karen more and more often. In these letters, she would write that she didn't consider herself worldly enough and wanted somebody to guide her. Karen would be 17 or 18 at this point, and Leonard read this and thought, this is amazing. Like, she can be submissive. She can be my Miranda. She can be exactly who I want her to be and do exactly what I want her to do. So, based on both of them thinking they fit each other perfectly, when Leonard proposed marriage in 1968, it was a done deal. He was still in the Marines at this point, so still, a lot of times they would just correspond, and in 1970s, he would be sent to his second tour of Vietnam. So, when it comes to his first couple of years of marriage, Karen would describe them as pretty average. That is, except for a couple of things. She noticed that before the marriage, when they were only correspond, well, the whole dominant personality wasn't as prevalent when it comes to Leonard, whereas now, it seemed like he more and more wanted to completely dominate her, what she was doing, where she was going, all of the decisions that she was making, and it seemed like he more wanted to be a dominant and for her to be his sex slave. And what went to support this is that Leonard would, kind of jokingly at first, proposition that Karen should sleep with his marine mates. Like, all of the marines, yeah, like, they should be kind of, like, exchanging Karen, so she should be going from one to the next. And at first she was like, okay, uh uh-huh, but then he continued mentioning it and propositioning this. And she started thinking more and more, this sounds like he wants me to do sex work on his behalf, like he wants me to get involved in this. 
What made her even more nervous and made her think that these definitely aren't just jokes is that Leonard would love Karen to either be completely naked in the house or to be dressed in these revealing outfits. So everything combined, it seemed like Leonard just wanted her as a possession that he can then distribute and then she would come back to him and he could still control everything that she did. May I remind you that this is what she described as average? So, you know, we are not going the right direction. It's all downhill from now on. So, 1917's come around. He is sent for a second tour in Vietnam. Now would be a good time for me to brief you about what Leonard Lake actually did within the Marine Corps, because he would be telling a completely different story, and psychiatrists, psychologists, anybody evaluating him noticed that that is a complete lie, and also they had on the record what his actual job was. So, from the 60s, from when he was instilled into Marines, Yes, he was using the weapons, but it was only, like, during practice. But he was never the person fighting. He was never in the field. He was actually on the base in, like, this little workshop working on radar machinery. He was literally fixing radars. He was good with technology, and that's what he was doing. That's what his time in the Marine Corps was limited to. So, in the 70s, yes, he was sent to Vietnam, but still, to do the exact same thing, to be stuck on base and to be repairing radars. But this is when his imagination kicks in, because he was surrounded by all of these soldiers that would inevitably be telling the stories of what actually happens on the battlefield. He started imagining that he was actually within the fights, that he was fighting this hard. To everybody that he was writing back home, he was writing as if he had PTSD. He was describing everything. He was describing that the worst thing that was to happen on the battlefield wouldn't be seen the dead bodies. It would actually be zipping up the bag once the corpse was to be taken away. And of course, this meant that everybody around him was like, "Uh, no, this isn't the worst thing. Like, why is he saying things like as if he is not stuck here fixing radars all day long? Like, we should get him checked out. But it wasn't because of that that he got checked out by somebody on the base. It was actually because he started, yet again, fantasizing, imagining, convincing himself that this is real. Convincing himself that this was real. That Karen, at home, was cheating on him. And these were so real for him, like, these suspicions were so real, that he didn't want to go visit, like, the chaplain that was on the base because he didn't find himself to be really religious. So, instead, he went to see a psychiatrist. Once he went to see the psychiatrist on base, he diagnosed him with a serious condition of impending schizophrenia, along with hysterical neurosis. And they recommended that he undergoes a treatment at their hospital so that he stays at the psychiatric ward for a couple of months and then to be shipped to California at the end of 1970. During the next few months, Leonard will be spending his time in the psychiatric ward before he is shipped back home to his wife. I'm smirking because what I'm gonna tell you next is single-handedly the weirdest account of events I have ever read in a true crime story. So, he's in the psychiatric ward and he's acting completely hinged, just like me during these videos. During his time in this ward, he decided he got fixated on stealing some governmental property. Karen really didn't know what the hell he was on about, but she knew that apparently this was his fixation, like, it was important to him. And from this point on, actually, something important happens. Everything he does in life from this point on he would call an operation. Like, let's say he was gonna go get, I don't know, fish and chips. He would call it Operation Chips. Quite literally every single thing that he was doing from this point on, he would consider an operation. So, during this operation, he couldn't find whatever he was searching for, and he blamed that on diarrhea. So, he returned this is, this is important. This is important. Because he had diarrhea, and this definitely affected this mission, he returned to his bed, and he realized that the way to avoid diarrhea would be eating chocolate. So, he just ate 
tons of chocolate because now he wanted to become constipated because becoming constipated would fix all of his problems and this operation would be successful because of that. So he would manage to steal governmental property. Quick sideline, the solution for diarrhea is like a really small bottle, kind of like a can of coke, just like don't overdo it, but actually it works. Like I've been <laughs> experimenting with that for my whole life. Well, he didn't have my advice, so he freaked Karen here out and he freaked all the psychiatrists on the base out because this does not make no sense, Leonard Lake. Like <laughs> this logic just doesn't work. <laughs> Having a shit diary and basing the success of weird operations where you also want to steal governmental property and then you're confessing up to that. Sure. So, he was discharged from the Marine Corps because of this in 1970 or 71. And yeah, he was discharged for medical reasons. He was never to return. So, we turn a page. It's a new life for Leonard Lake. And now he is married and spending most of his time with Karen. So, that's not gonna go well. With him out of the Marines, doing just like some menial part-time jobs, they weren't doing well financially. They actually had to move to this cheaper house in San Jose, California. And instead of stepping up, maybe doing a course in something, making sure he finds a full-time job now, instead Leonard Lake came up with a genius idea. And that is that Karen should be going to topless bars. She should be stripping and selling her body for money. She should be doing that full time while he just sits on the couch and lives his best life. So he starts suggesting it to Karen. At first she's like, yeah, you're crazy. And then as with everything with Leonard Lake, she realizes that the guy doesn't have sense of humor and that this is not a joke. Now, Karen is working at these topless bars for 40-50 hours a week, and then she comes home and Leonard has just been chilling there the whole day, expecting her to still serve him, and in particular to comply with all of his sexual desires. Because this is when the collector really comes into play again, and he starts showing off his real dominant side. Leonard would introduce what he would call controlled beatings, where without an argument, without anything, sort of more like a foreplay in his eyes, he would just, at first, like, lightly slap Karen on the face. Then it would be, like, a stronger slap. Then it would be a complete, like, just punch with a fist into her face before they would even start doing it. And then just to ensure that he is messing with her head, as they would be, like, in the middle of the intercourse, as they would be in the middle of doing it, he would say, uh, you know what, you don't really do it for me anymore. Like, I can't even, like, get off during this sexual experience. So, like, we should really start swapping couples. Like, we should really start, like, introducing something else, you know, having some extracurricular sexual activities. And Karen said, again, reluctantly, she accepted. She was, what, 18, 19 at this point. She didn't know anything better. She was completely under this man's spell. So, she said, like, even though they would, like, go and meet other people, they only swapped partners once. Due to all of the control that Leonard had over Karen now, he really started just developing and growing his god complex. What I mean by that is, let's say you were in the presence of Leonard Lake and you said like, oh god, he would say yes, as if you're referring to him. Imagine how annoying. Imagine how annoying. You'd just be like, oh my god. He'd be like, yes. Like, you called. How can I assist? This would actually, if this doesn't, if this wasn't to end in crime, this would actually be a hilarious story. But, you know, annoying, annoying, still, still a cunt but hilarious. Because of his temper, because he was completely different than Karen ever imagined this marriage would be, she did think of leaving him. And it kind of started being like a recurring thought. She would go to work and she'd be like, how the hell do I leave him? Like, I don't want to go home. So one night, well, Leonard really fixed that for her. Because he was there to pick her up. Because he was, again, overbearing, controlling, had nothing else to do with his life. So he was waiting for her in that parking lot of that 
topless bar and she exited with this patron and he lost it. He was so jealous. Like he made it home before her and then threw all of her clothes onto the front lawn. And she just like came home and she's like, okay, I can't deal with this. So that night she slept in her car. But then the next day, when she left the car, he broke inside of the car and took her clothes back. You know, completely rational human being at this point. So Karen realized, well, you know, I have the pay from the last night. I didn't hand it over to him. I'm just going to start living out of the camper home that they had at first. And then she actually rented out a flat once she had enough money. But Leonard wouldn't give up so easily. He would break into her flat and burn her clothes with acid. He would make sure that she is still petrified of him. Eventually, though, it fizzled out. Like, he realized Karen isn't coming back, and they finalized their divorce in 1972. Leonard's half-sister Janet is going to say about this breakup that this is the only time that she saw Leonard cry. And this is when he started speaking about how he hates all women. And just like the Marines period of time was impressionable for him in terms of, well, his mental state and how he saw everything as an operation. Well, that combined with The Collector, with reading that book, like everything was so impressionable on Leonard. This divorce led to two possible pathways. If you were to trust the book, Die For Me, I'm not exaggerating, about 50 pages of this book is Leonard's love conquests. It's like how he meets all of these women for these different things that we're going to talk about and how they're all so impressioned by him. They love him so much. He's so successful with the ladies and his sex drive is insane. But on the other end, we have the public, the psychologists, the people that actually analyzed him, and even his journal entries. Seeing him as an incel, as an involuntary celibate, as somebody who is so angry at the women, at the females, and believes that they should suffer because they all aim to be with 20% of the guys, with the most good-looking, with the chads of this world, neglecting all of the betas, neglecting all of the rest, which involves Leonard Lake because he just isn't as great-looking. He has receding hairline already at this point. Even from his own journals, Leonard Lake didn't see himself as this amazing looking guy. And he fought because other women don't want something serious with guys like him. They deserve to suffer. They deserve to be treated as objects. In 1972, he would place an ad in the papers looking for a woman, and this woman called Jennifer would respond to it. At first, they would start dating completely normal, but then eventually it turned out violent. He started acting out in a more dominant way. He again tried to get her into sex work and to get her to pose for nude pictures, just like with Karen. He'd get her to pose nude for him, just like he did with Karen, with his ex-wife. When that wasn't enough, he would ask her, does she have any friends that would pose for him? Once this wouldn't be enough, he would start to talk to Jennifer about recording snuff films. When she would ask him, like, isn't that illegal? Which, yes, very much it is. Well, wouldn't you get caught and then go to jail? He would say he never plans to get caught with any of his endeavors because he actually has cyanide hidden in his tooth gap. So if he ever gets caught, he would just, like, chew on that and just commit suicide on the spot and will never actually serve time in prison. In 1973, Jennifer moves out, and at this point, two obsessions were constantly just on repeat in Leonard Lake's mind. One was the fantasy of capturing and holding a young woman and keeping her as his sex slave. And the second one, kind of again alluding to his time in the Marines, was images of a nuclear holocaust. At this point, he regarded the end of the world, this Holocaust, as something that is unavoidable. It's unpreventable, and he needs to be ready for it. In order for him to be ready for it, he would need to find a perfect location, somewhere isolated, where, you know, he wouldn't be attacked, bombed, like another world war wouldn't happen there. Or, rather, he would need to find somebody to dig up a bunker so that he can hide underground. 
Having those few ideas in his mind, he would eventually move to Ukiah, which is about 130 miles from San Francisco. This would be a rural area, but sort of like a camp. He would find a job at this government-funded firm, and they would be building and renovating this low-income housing. So it would kind of be like small cottages with like sheds to them, and they would all work together on this project. While he would be working his way up in this job and eventually become a crew leader, he also enrolled into taking classes in animal sciences and meat cutting at Mendocino College. Because of his way with knives and saws here, he impressed the college staff and even convinced them to give him a part-time teaching assignment where he was to tutor these boys in his class on survival in the wilderness. While on this property, these people are living in cabins now, and he meets this woman called Venus. And Venus kind of just wanted some work done on her cabin, like she wanted it sort of remodeled. So Leonard saw his opportunity to offer that to her for a small price that is living for free with her. And of course, that developed into this sexual relationship. And here, Leonard would start sharing his fantasies. He would mention Miranda Project, he mentioned this whole Holocaust situation, and Venus realized that he already had some, like, small contraption, kind of just looked like a hole at that point, dug out next to his own cabin. But she never took this really seriously. When he would speak about the Miranda Project, Venus understood that he wanted to build a shelter for the refugees, where people would be driven from the city during the environmental collapse that he described to her. And when she saw this hole that he dug, Venus assumed that this is like an old-fashioned root cellar, which is like a place where he would be storing food. She never really saw the inclination that Leonard was serious about this. It would be a completely different reason why Venus just left this whole situation and why she realized that, well, actually Leonard Lake is one huge SOB. And that is when he met her with his supposed friend, Charles Gunner. Charles was actually like a godfather at his first marriage, so he knew Charles for quite some time. And Charles was married and had two daughters at the time, so he just introduced Venus to him, and, you know, he was showing him this new location where he was living. And Venus noticed how cruel Leonard was towards Charles, his supposed, like, best friend, and also, if you're thinking that this is Charles Ng, it's not. That's where I thought this story will lead. Completely different person. But Charles will end up being an important factor in this story. And also important to understand how Leonard Lake fought. So when Charles went to visit them on this occasion, Leonard would be particularly cruel. Like, he would call him a whale or fat Charles, because apparently he was fatter. When you look at pictures of Leonard Lake, you're like, how can you mock anybody, mate? Like, just how? But during this trip, he would go on these steep hikes and he would make sure to go on, like, the steepest, hardest places to walk on and just, like, hike upwards. And then we just mock Charles constantly, calling him fat, like, oh, why can't you make it? Why can't you do this? Why are you all huffing and puffing and sweaty? After this visit, Venus started picking up on different red flags, like that Leonard was actually criticizing everybody around him. Like, he saw the flaws in everybody but himself. So he would start criticizing her friends. Then, of course, finally, when there was nobody around, well, it was Venus that something was wrong with. And when she realized she is being manipulated and that this is how this guy's mind works, well, she started backing off. There was even this occasion when Leonard kind of was looped in, like, he realized, like, he doesn't have as much control over Venus, and she protested against something that he said, and he even pushed her off the ladder. And this was the final point for this woman. She was like, N I mean, if I plan to stay alive, I can't stay close to this man. So she decided to sell him this cabin for, like, a reduced price and got out of there. 
as he was a crew leader at this property right now, he would start getting more and more inappropriate with the people that worked for him. He would go as far to ask a bunch of them if their girlfriends wanted to pose for nude pictures. Really, the history repeats itself in many of Leonard Lake's conquests. So, to summarize about at least 50 pages of this book, he would follow pretty much the same pattern with every single single woman. He would either meet her through personal ads when nothing else was available, or it would be a person kind of like Venus that lived on the property that he just spotted like as a new person coming in. There was this guy Barnes whose girlfriend came to visit and Leonard would kind of try to poach her, show her the album of pictures that he has had of other girls, and tell her that he's a professional photographer, that this is what he does, and will he will she pose nude for him? And in cases where they would say no, he would still be pushy, he would still try to manipulate them and turn the situation around, or he would try to find a middle ground in a way. So, with Barnes's girlfriend, for example, he got her to just spend some hours of the day nude around the house and probably, from what we know from his past, took pictures of her without her consent, without her knowing. In certain situations, his middle way would be to try to get these girls, whether they were girlfriends of somebody or these girls that he himself dated then, once he was bored of disposing nude, having sex with them, getting into bondage, to sleep with Charles Gunner, who, as we know, is his friend and also married, but he desperately needed to get laid. He just wasn't getting laid within his own marriage. Or he would be testing the grounds and talking to them about Holocaust, about Project Miranda, about his plans for the future, and just seeing if this person, if this woman that he met, would be a perfect Miranda. We also can't underestimate that this guy was so skillful at seeking the opportunities. When it came to his own crew, he realized he would read the room and figure out that they don't really feel comfortable with their girlfriends posing nude for him. So, he would propose nudist parties where they would just gather all together and they would just drink up and everybody would enjoy them. There would be no harm of them. So, he had a couple of those. Then, there was the story of this goat that is apparently really important in Leonard's Lake story. In my head, mostly because at this point he was 34. This is 1979. So, I don't know how he came into the possession of this goat, but on this ranch, on this property, somebody brought this goat. I don't know if they bought it, whatever. The goat appeared. But the goat didn't look like a goat that you would normally picture. Apparently, one of its horns, either it had only one of the horns, either it was operated on, or one of the two horns were sort of like in the middle of her head. So, the goat looked like a unicorn. I think somebody operated, somebody did some fuckery on this goat, but he saw the opportunity here because of all of the mystical powers that a unicorn would have. (laughs) Though this would be like a unicorn from like Wish or whatever. It's a goat. It's not... it's, It's not a horse to begin with, but okay. Unicorns definitely exist in Leonard Lake's mind, so he would be bringing this goat to these different local farm festivals. And this is how he started poaching women and girls. Another important thing in his life was that the age never mattered. He didn't mind if women were like 12, 16, 20-something. Like, he never cared. And we just always neglect to mention that he was also a pedophile because he slept with a ton of underage girls. According to him. According to his own journals. So, he would be getting women to pose by the river, like in these rural areas in the mountains with this unicorn that is a goat. And, of course, they would have to pose nude in order to exude these mystical powers that this unicorn has. During this period where Leonard was using this one horn goat to pick up all of these women, his true colors really came out. 
even though stalker wasn't really used by definition at that time, he truly was one. When he would get fixated on a woman, he wouldn't be letting go. Just like with his ex-wife Karen, he would make their life hell. Because he thought, like, he opened up, he told them about Project Miranda, he told them about this Armageddon, like, him creating this cell in order to avoid the end of the world, and what? They just planned to just leave him. And he thought of these relationship progressing in a certain way with every single one of these women. But then he did have conquests, he did have women where he just didn't care. And in most of those situations, he wouldn't care because he would find a substitute himself, where he felt, like, more strongly drawn to these women. And two of those women that he was more strongly drawn to were named Darlene and Cricket. Both of them, from what I remember, he poached with that posing with a goat nude in the nature, because the goat was actually a unicorn. He met Darlene first, and Darlene was only 16 at the time. And there were descriptions, apparently, from Darlene's journals in this book that were so disgusting, because if you remember, he was 39 at this point, and Darlene, like, gave up her virginity to him. And according to Darlene, he was actually a lot more respectful than we know Leonard Lake to be with her. Like, yes, he did ask her to pose nude, he did suggest, like, maybe involving somebody else, but every time she said no, he wouldn't be pushing it. And she said that he was never violent, that he was never into BDSM, he was never into any of that. Darlene's parents, though, honed in on this, and they realized, like, no, you're not gonna be wasting time here in the middle of nowhere. We are gonna be sending you to the boarding school and just, like, sort of separate the situation. Like, you'll forget about Leonard Lake. You know, it, it was different times. Like, they probably didn't even know his age. So, Darlene left, but she promised that she will love him forever, and the two of them kept corresponding via letters. And this is when Leonard met Cricket. Again, he was on one of his fairs with Sir Lancelot, that was the name of the goat. And Cricket came by. Cricket was, of course, not her actual name. This new woman, Cricket, wouldn't just be fine with posing nude in nature in the middle of nowhere. No. It seemed like sexually, finally, Leonard Lake has found a match. She would be open to sleeping with other people, other women as well. She would be open to bondage, using sex toys, whatever he named, she would be up for it. Posing nude, say no more, compared to other women that he had to beg, manipulate into this. With cricket, everything was just out in the open, everything was possible. And as he is still corresponding with Arlene, who is in the boarding school now, he's kind of trying to make her jealous. He is sort of propositioning a freeway with this woman, Cricket. And now what you might be wondering at this point is, like, is everybody on this ranch fine with him basically just, what, hoeing around, bringing all of these women over, these women then starting to live with him, and then at some point, once they realize he's a douche, then just fucking off of this ranch. And actually, everybody there never had problem with any of these women, or his lifestyle, for that matter. They had an issue with him, because they noticed a couple of things kind of just seem to be nicked from their own houses. He seems to be stealing stuff from his neighbors. One of his employees would actually end up reporting him, and Leonard went to jail. But the judge was quite lenient, and they decided, instead of, like, spending a lengthy period of time within jail, that they're just gonna give him, like, a year probation. But when he was incarcerated, all of those doubts, all of those, like, strong ideologies came back to Leonard, and he just promised himself, no, okay, you know, cyanide pill, yeah, I'm never gonna get incarcerated again. Once released from jail, all of the people living on the ranch demanded that he leaves. So, in 81, he packs up all of his bags with Cricket, and they just leave. And they're just driving, sort of like, aimlessly, until they reach this place called Philo. It's kind of like, again, rural area, only 150 people living there, but sort of like on the other side of San Francisco. 
Now that they are in Philo, another woman enters the picture, because Leonard's sex drive is insane at this point, even though Cricket seems to be meeting all of his sexual needs. And I'm only mentioning this woman because I know at this point there's so many names. (laughs) There's so many names. I'm only gonna mention Connie because... Her account of events is actually quite interesting, like how she perceived Leonard Cricket, that whole relationship. So, when she moved to Philo, she literally responded to an ad by Leonard Lake to just do some work and help out in the motel. But it's as soon as she arrived there that she realized that they were kind of looking more for a sexual partner. And it was more for Cricket, from what she described, because at that point they figured out that Cricket was actually bisexual. So she wanted to try out, you know, having sex with a woman. And she described that place, like their room at that motel in Philo, Like, as, you know, seeing different masks, like, different bondage, kind of, like, hooks for the ropes on the walls in the room. But she said, like, nothing extreme, and that she never did anything that wasn't consensual. At this point, Leonard was still writing to Darlene, and he told her that they are now making porn they are making the tapes that they will sell, that Connie has arrived in the location, that she is there for the freeway relationship that he is having with Cricket. And he just seemed to have been still trying to make Darlene jealous, but also still kept this relationship because of his possessive ways. He just wanted to dominate every single woman in his life. Now, in 1981, because Cricket and him have been going strong for, I don't know, two years now from the GOAT incident, well, he decided to put a ring on it, and they got married. And this is why I mentioned Connie, because from her perspective, this wedding was an actual shit show. Of course, Charles appeared to be the best man at this wedding, and Leonard used every opportunity to degrade him, degrade his best friend, to call him fat, to make fun of him, because apparently Charles, during this wedding, tried to hit on Connie. And then he would go to Connie be like, isn't he, like, obese? Isn't he just, like, a whale? Like, yeah, he tried to pull this same stunt with Cricket. Like, he tried to hit on my girl. And Connie was just so confused at this wedding. Like, what kind of relationship is everybody having? Like, this Charles guy is apparently married, but all of them want to sleep with each other's wives. And also, what Connie said was that Leonard's half-sister Janet was at the wedding. And she kind of, just by looking at how Leonard is acting with Janet, she said, I think he wants to have incestuous relationship with his half-sister as well. As he got relaxed on his own wedding, as he obviously started drinking, probably, you know, smoking some weed, etc., Lake strike up the conversation with Connie, who at this point was so confused, so out there already, and he just started talking about his brother Donald and how much he just hated him because he was a leech. And then he mentions Charles Gunner again. And here comes something that is important in the story and that I haven't mentioned so far, I think. And that is that Charles was also getting the benefits. He was also getting the money from the Social Security. So, Connie didn't pay much attention to that, but it just goes to say that at this point, Leonard was getting angrier and angrier by day. Nothing was sufficient for him in terms of his sex drive. And he seemed to have a specific type of people that made him angry and that he couldn't just avoid telling other people about, like, how angry these people made him for no substantial reason, like, not affecting him in any way, not really doing harm to him in any way. And it also happens that these people are his own brother and his own best friend. So, safe to say, after this wedding, Connie returned to that motel and she decided to pack up her bags and get the fuck out of there, because she was like, nah, these relationships here, I just, it's, it's a bit too much. Like, they also kind of brought me here on false pretense, so I'm out. As she was saying bye to everybody at the motel, she also waved goodbye to this small Asian man that came around a few weeks before. 
Before Charlie's arrival, Leonard Lake will hear from a guy called Mark Novak, who was the soldier that spent a few days with him on the ranch at the previous location where he lived. Novak passed Leonard's details to Charles Ing, who was a Marine who was in some trouble. Charles, at this point, was a fugitive who slipped away from custody and needed a safe place to hide out. Charles and Leonard start chatting up, and soon Leonard realizes that Charlie has some substantial interest in survivalism. Around this time, they also meet this woman that lived on this ranch nearby who wanted to start a youth camp. This woman wanted to hire Leonard and possibly his wife, Cricket, that was currently working as a teacher's aide, and then, I mean, whoever really they had on the ranch in order to build this youth camp, and then maybe, you know, Leonard can use his survivalist skills to teach these young cadets. But before this could even come to fruition, in April 1982, the FBI actually got a tip from Mendocino County, where these guys were based. And they got a tip that Charles Ng might be residing on this ranch. As soon as this happened, they had FBI agents surrounding this place. They had a helicopter, they had the FBI agents on the ground, and they just managed to catch Charles Ng as he sort of spotted the helicopter and tried to run. And they arrested him then and there. Now, of course, Leonard Lake acts super suspicious, and he is also just there as they're raiding the whole premise. And he is saying, yes, some of these guns are his, and the rest belongs to Charles. He kind of tries to shove him under the bus. But he slips up and says that he was aware that a lot of weapons that Charlie Ying had were contraband, were stolen. He shouldn't really have had them in the possessions. There were grenades, it seemed like military weapons. Some of those, like nunchaku sticks, the ones that you would use for martial arts, and a ton of ammunition. And because of this slip-up, the officers arrest Lake, and they drive him to the police force, Cricket follows, she posts bail. But now he's possibly facing 17 years in prison because of the felony charges, because of knowing that there was this contraband that was illegal on his property. And also, if you remember, Leonard did burglarize a couple of people at his previous place in Ukiah, so he was facing those charges as well, because he violated probation there. And Leonard, as we know, did not want to end up in prison. He had that whole plan with taking the cyanide pill rather than landing in prison. But he thought it shouldn't really come to this so far. Because he still had that plan of Miranda Project, Bunker, Holocaust. Like, he still had so much to live for. Why would he take this imaginary cyanide that he most definitely had in his position and end it all? So, instead, he just decided not to show up for his court hearing. And from that point on, Leonard Lake was a fugitive. And at this point, Charles Ng is in jail. So, let's talk a bit about Charles to see how their two worlds matched and collided. Charles was born in 1960 in Hong Kong, and he was born in a typical Asian family, just not really well off at the time. So, he was born to father Kenneth Ng, who lived with his huge family in this small apartment in this high-rise building. His dad, Kenneth, really had a hard childhood during the Second World War, and he realized the importance of education because of it. So, he swore once he got married and he had kids that he will provide them with the best education possible. Once Kenneth met his wife, Oi Ping, he knew that he really wanted a boy. And at first, the two of them had two daughters, but he was like, no, let's try one last time. I know, I know a boy is to come. And on no other day but Christmas Day of 1960, the family was blessed with the birth of Charles Cheetah Ing. Unlike Leonard Lake, Charles, during his childhood, had a completely different relationship with animals. 
And I think we all know where this story is gonna go when I tell you what the animal that he had really close relationship with was. The animal was a chicken, right? So there was this chicken that was apparently living in this flat that Charles just collected from the street, and he was obsessed. He treated this chicken as a pet. So one day, Charles returns from school and he realizes that the chicken is like in a, in a soup, in a pot over there, and he freaks out. This traumatized him forever. It didn't stop him from like eating meat, but still, it traumatized him forever. Then there was also this turtle that he found on the streets and brought home, but the turtle was just shitting all over the place, and they didn't have like a box or anything for it, so they suggested that he lets it out to this pond. Again, Charles was heartbroken. Then there was another dog that he picked up from the street and brought into a flat, and the family yet again told him he needs to let the dog out, like these animals can't live in the flat. And all three times he would just get so emotionally connected to these animals, and then just the idea of letting them go would bring him so much pain for such an impressionable age. Another thing that left an impression on Charles during his childhood was the martial arts. By watching these movies, by watching Bruce Lee, he knew that he wanted to become such a martial arts expert once he grows up. And he even started creating those, like, nunchaku sticks himself, because, of course, his parents wouldn't allow him to have them. And his mom always worried, because he would be obsessed with this. He would be, like, creating sacks of, like, flour and then putting them up so that he can box. Or just creating this training equipment himself in order to train. And his mom just thought, like, no, you need to focus on education. So both mom and dad were on it. And unfortunately for them, Charles wasn't. The two daughters, perfectly fine. They had decent grades, never an issue. But Charles always rebelled. Not just that he rebelled, like, he almost set one school on fire. He would get bad grades, he would be expelled from one school, and then because his parents were paying for private tuition, then they were like, no, this is bringing the shame to the family. Like, what other school is going to accept you? So every time he would bring bad grades home, or he would pull some stunt where he would burn the school down and, you know, get expelled, his dad would beat him. And he would beat him with, like, either a cane or a bell. So these would be severe beatings. And every time that would happen, Charles would just withdraw and get more and more quiet, more and more silent, and just less and less expressive, he was just sitting and seeding. What I guess, and here I'm speculating, didn't help is, well, that he was nearsighted, so he needed these, like, huge-ass glasses at the time, because remember what glasses looked like back in the past, from the ancient days where we are at? And especially when you're nearsighted, like, my dad is and has, like, huge power of, like, the... and has, like, the huge freaking power in them, so they just look insane, like, your eyes look huge, he probably got bullied for it. And also, he was artsy. He was very talented when it comes to painting, origami, anything really to do with making something out of something else. But on one day in school, he, I think, like, left his package with, like, brushes and paper and different colors inside of school, and somebody stole it. And Charles would, yet again, take it to heart. He would just withdraw, and his parents didn't know what to do with him. One of the few things that pisses me off the most in this story is that Charles, out of the two, actually could have had a completely normal life. Boring, if so. Like, he could have gone on to a completely different path. But what we can't neglect, and probably why he didn't, was exactly because of this. Exactly because of how impressionable he was. One other thing that left such an impression on Charles was seeing his dad in a uniform. Kenneth, at the time, joined the army reserve, and he had to wear this uniform and attend training sessions. People speculated here that this, combined with the whole martial arts ideology, really inspired Charles to pursue a military career later. But before that, he would actually go to see a psychiatrist himself, because of everything that he was doing, like causing arson, running from school, trying to burn it to the crisp, for <laughs> instance. 
because of him trying to burn his school down to the crisp, because of him enacting acts of vandalism, he would actually go on to playgrounds. He was 10 at this point. He would go on playgrounds and try to attack children that weren't Asian, so like Western children. He would just go and attack them. Speculated again that he might have been bullied and will later in life be bullied by Westerners. What got their parents to actually seek psychiatric help and treatment was that he actually stole a picture from the friend's home. I don't know what kind of picture this is, but hey, it's open for interpretation. Because at this point, what also came to light was that he was writing obscene letters, from what I read in this book, to his teachers. And the fact that, you know, he tried to burn the school down in an experiment in a chemistry lab. So he did receive some psychiatric help at the age of 10. Now, as you remember, he is expelled from this school and his parents really need to get him educated. They are still focused on getting all of their children education. And as they know, nobody will really accept him in schools in Hong Kong. They communicated with their family elsewhere. At first, it was in England. So they moved Charles to this uncle that lived in the UK. But here, you could kind of see that, okay, he would have had abandonment issues like Leonard Lake. But in Charles's case, his parents actually listened. Like Charles complained about his conditions and how he was neglected compared to his uncle's children. And his mom actually came to England to assess the situation and she decided that yes, he isn't getting enough food. They're just not treating him like part of the family. So she moves him back to Hong Kong. Now is when they reach out to their family in San Francisco area. They had an aunt there that would enroll him into this parochial school next to San Francisco airport. So, on a student visa, Charles Ng arrived to the U.S. in 1979. Charles would barely start his time in college. He probably appeared a couple of days. And then, without letting anybody in the family know, he went in for a recruitment day in 1979, when he was 19 years old, to this Marine Corps unit. And now you're like, okay, so he walked in on a recruitment day and he walked out because he is... Chinese. He can't just enlist to Marine Corps, Maya. Yeah, this could have very well been where this story ended, and Charles Singh and Leonard Lake would have never met. But unfortunately, that's not how the story went. Apparently, according to the records later, somebody probably a recruiting officer here, faked his birth certificate. And his birth certificate stated that he was born in Indiana. And he was accepted by Marine Corps. And people, including myself, will later speculate that Charles was accepted there because he knew how to impress them. Because he knew what they wanted to hear. They wanted somebody that can follow orders. They wanted somebody they can mold. And Charles was a perfect Marine in that case. The training Charles would receive gave him the expertise in the use of weapons, especially these different variety of guns. This particular training actually started up an interest in ability to survive anything. He started suddenly reading publications on survivalism and seeking out other men for companionship on the same interest. At this point, he was still a loner, and due to his limited social skills, what he would do is he would try to build rapport with people by telling them that he is obsessed with Bruce Lee movies, and they would be like... Okay, cool. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. But then he would tell them to hold up like a pencil kind of here so that he could do like his martial arts kicks, which is cute when you're five. Not so cute when you're like in the Marines at like 19, 20. They're kind of probably looking at him like, is this man an actual joke? But on the field and 
In actual training, Charles was excelling. They put him to train as a gunner, which is this position where the people are operating on the anti-tech missile devices. So some of his duties involved preparing the team for combat, carrying the ammunition, helping set up the weapons, and assuring the lead gunner's safety. And his superiors always said that Charles met all of the requirements of his military operational specialty and always did what he was told. And this is a personal opinion, but I think we neglect this particular part when we think about so many serial killers thriving on structure, thriving in the army, or within the military, within marine environment. But it's not because they thrive on structure. Like, if that was true, Charles Singh would have been great in school. He would have loved that. It is because he is submissive in nature. He just had to find something that would be thrilling for him, that he would see a higher purpose for himself here. He would see himself as the soldier, as somebody following this routine and excelling at it. He had to find his passion and then within that passion, he could very well thrive. So if people just knew how to sell him a school, you know. Because Charles was expressive about his interest in survivalism, he would eventually meet Mark Novak. Remember the guy that would end up introducing him to Leonard? The two of them would find that they have similar interests. They would chat about weapons, techniques, and methods of staying alive in the wild. And Novak was particularly drawn to Charles because Charles was against, well, anything fun, really, like drinking, smoking, going out, having fun with people. And Novak was a married man, so he wanted to stay away from everything sinful like that. And at the time, just in passing, Novak would mention this guy that he knew from the ranch in Northern California that introduced himself to him as Tom Myers, but he later found out that his actual name was Leonard Lake. Novak would describe Leonard Lake as a shit-talker, somebody who was definitely into survivalism, But he would just be telling him all of these wild ideas of building a bunker in the middle of nowhere, and he would be showing anybody who asked his album of pictures of nude women. But at that moment, this comment would just be sort of like in passing. There wouldn't be much else that Novak shared with Charles. In 1981, as Charles was doing one of his watches, like sort of observing the base, protecting the property so nobody steals anything, well, something in him really, really did not allow him to stray away from criminal life. So he decides why wouldn't he be the one who steals something? You know, these watches exist because of people like him. So he decides, you know what? There is a lot of ammunition here that would go for a lot of money if I was to sell it. This is the marine weapons that we are talking about. So he starts chatting with two other people, sort of looping them in on the plan and trying to get it done in such a way that nobody really blames the guard, the person that is actually doing the watch. Their genius plan was for Charles to break into the room where the weapons were still as much as possible and then give it to this other person to basically dig it somewhere in the middle of nowhere to dig a hole and bury all of these weapons where even Charles wouldn't know where this location was. And then from there on, they're going to do kind of like a rental system for these weapons where they will rent them for huge amounts of money. And then again, they will collect the weapons, bury them in a different location so that nobody really knows where these weapons are. In that way, everybody's safe from going to jail. And also, well, Charles can't really snitch on them because he wouldn't technically know where these weapons are either. The plan is put into action in October 81, and two other officers watch him, sort of like one from the other side, the other keeps guard on the other side of the room, as he steals. As soon as he gives these weapons to somebody else, he never saw these weapons again, nor did he see the money made out of them. But what he did see was the walls of a prison cell, because he 
did get arrested a couple of days after because one of them snitched. So Charles knew how this thing goes. Whoever talks first will get the least amount of time to serve in jail. So he snitched on who was in on this plan. So the police officers made a deal with him that he will only be serving a short sentence doing hard labor. After the interrogation, Charles is waiting to be transported back to the jail cell. And here he spots an opportunity. The guards didn't even have him shackled. They just kind of let him roam free while they were waiting for this bus. And one of them seems to be really tired. He kind of just, like, tried to relax and, like you know, put his head down for a second, and the other one just went to have a phone call. So, Charles in here kind of pulled a bundy and just jumped out of the window and started running. He actually knew that there was a friend of his that lived in that area, so he went there for cover. But of course, all of Charlie's friends, under inverted commas really, were from the Marine Corps, so he knew he can't stay there for long. He only stayed overnight, and then the next day, well, this friend got a call from the police saying, if you're covering for him, you're gonna be an accomplice. Like, do you know his whereabouts? So this guy told him, Listen, I'm gonna give you a drive. That's as much as I can do. Get into the trunk and I will drop you somewhere in the middle of nowhere. This friend that helped cover for Charles Ng that night and that later dropped him off in the middle of nowhere just happened to be Mark Novak. They then gave him the contact details of Leonard Lake. We are now back in 1982 in Philo when the FBI raided the property and arrested Charles Ng. After that, Leonard Lake, as I mentioned, was a fugitive as well, because he was an accomplice, he was aware of all of the weapons that were on the property, and he was on the run with Cricket. And Cricket didn't in particular like it. She still liked Lake, she still thought they were on the same page sexually, she just didn't particularly like this moving around, just not being able to stay at one place. She didn't really enjoy being the fugitive of the law and protecting his ass. Cricket here would decide to back off and for the two of them to just meet up occasionally for just sex and fun. And this is when Leonard moved back in with Charles Gunner. But he actually wouldn't stay there for too long. But while he did, he did do some damage. According to him, Charles was the one to ask him to sleep with his wife, so he did. According to the wife, it only happened on one occasion, and it was just, like, because his friend asked him to. There was nothing, like, kinky, bdsm -y about it. He'd still be corresponding with Darlene. He met up with her once, but then eventually she would leave to go back to college and studying, and she would find a boyfriend herself, so he wouldn't hear from her for a while. He'd meet up with Cricket now and then. He introduced another woman as a trio, open marriage kind of relationship. And this woman named Rhonda would have an interesting account of events, which I kind of feel like this is when Leonard really started escalating. He knew that he needs to put his work into fruition, and he was just confused as to how to do this without, like, without wasting any time, ensuring that he actually doesn't end up in prison or having to take his cyanide pill. Because with Rhonda, at first, he gave her a fake name. Then he revealed his real identity. Then he started sharing openly how he believes some people need to be erased from this world, mentioning his brother and his best friend, Charles Gunner, as, like, potential people to get rid of. After that, he would stick to his usual structure. He would talk to her about his abandonment issues. He would try to build rapport and manipulate. He'd ask Rhonda to pose for him, get her involved with cricket, again, suggest, like, more provocative acts, and that would escalate the relationship for him. But this here, fortunately for cricket, who was loyal and sticking around for this whole time, after Rhonda realized that Leonard is a shit show and that this whole relationship is messed up, 
left, like all of the other women in his life, Cricket kind of probably had that moment of realization where she looked at Leonard and she was like, why the hell am I staying here after all of these women left? Like, what am I doing? Like, there's nothing special. I don't want to be by myself with this guy. In fact, if the history shows, I was always the one asking for somebody else to be here in order to be comfortable. So, she submits the divorce papers, and the two of them finalized their divorce in 1982. Two things happened right now that, in my opinion, triggered one another. Because, as you could imagine, abandonment issues probably kicked in. Again, yet another wife left him. How dare they? How dare women just leave Leonard Lake? This is, like, unacceptable. First Karen, then Cricket, not to mention all of the women in between. Every single woman seems to be leaving Leonard Lake, and he's such a decent human. Every woman seems to just not want anything to do with Leonard Lake. So, what he does is he starts hanging with Charles Gunner again. And at this moment, Charles Gunner's wife and kids leave him as well, because he was abusive. And Leonard would not approve of this. His friend Charles was abusive towards both the wife and the kids, but Leonard thought that he should have treated them all differently. So, I think this triggered something in Leonard to finally start turning certain parts of his plans into action, because this is when he goes home. And he goes home to see his brother, Donald. His family won't suspect anything here, and they're actually pleased. Like, suddenly, Leonard is displaying interest in spending some time with his brother. And he actually suggested that they go on this trip, because Leonard actually found Donald a perfect job. We know that he has limited capacity, and Leonard was, like, looking around, and he found this ad for a house sitter. So, he suggested Donald will fit this position perfectly. He told them some lies about it, where it is, what it's about. He helped his brother pack up the suitcase and leave the house. And nobody will ever see Donald again. After this trip to visit his brother Donald, Leonard truly became everything that he hated in the world, because suddenly he was the person leaving off his brother's social security, his brother's benefits. He started journaling in 1983, and this is how he saw it, because, of course, he never saw that he was doing the same thing that his brother was. I am a dangerous person. Society would worry if they knew I existed and what I was up to. But more than my victim, I am most suitable of victims. I don't exist in the official world. No job, no taxes, no one to keep track of me day to day. If I were to disappear, it might be months before anyone would even wonder. And then, what could they do? And as much as I hate his ego and him himself saying that he is a dangerous person, you know, remember when he called himself a god? He's kind of right. But there will still be time before he disappears. Because he goes back to Charles Gunner. And Charles was still, at this time, living with his two daughters. And here, yet again, just like with Donald, I think he started the chain reaction. He started actually putting all of these plans that now he has had for almost two decades finally into action. It was finally his way of feeling useful. So, he met this woman that was sort of like a couple of houses from Charles, and he explained to her that Charles's wife just left him, and like, he needs to take care of these two daughters. He deserves a vacation. He deserves, like, a week's break. Can she just possibly babysit, house it for some time, just, you know, check up on the girls. They're all grown up already. But just, like, check up on them while him and Charles just go out for a trip. And, yeah, you guessed it. Nobody ever saw Charles Gunner again. The way that Leonard would describe Charles's departure in his journal sounds like a line from Taken. He said, Charles stayed up north. I have the children for a while. Is this a ransom note, Leonard? (laughs) What are we doing here? But to other people, he would say that Charles fell in love and he abandoned his family. And everybody was like, 
typical Charles, why don't we trust Leonard forever? With Charles gone, he's taking his benefits payments, his social security payments as well, but, I mean, he's kind of inconvenienced having to, like, babysit his two kids now. So, he starts spinning the story that actually Charles isn't coming back. Somebody should take them into foster care. And the way he knows that Charles isn't coming back is because Leonard has footage of him beating his children. So, he would go to the authorities if he was to ever approach them again. So, finally, friends of the family, friends of Wiki and Charles, take these girls into foster care, at least until Charles returns, which, as we know, will be never. So, at this point, Leonard is living his best life. He is, yes, everybody that he hated, but he doesn't see it that way, because, you know, he still goes back to his ways, like small thefts, small acts of crime, just like taking somebody else's social benefits. He is not a leech, because technically he's just a criminal who is stealing somebody else's money. He is also forging Charles's checks, something that he actually did when Charles was alive, and in his journals he named this Operation Fish. And he named it Operation Fish because Operation Whale would be too obvious, so... Well, according to Leonard Lake, is a fish, so that's why he called it Operation Fish, because he called Charles a whale. If you haven't been following so far, everything is fat shaming when it comes to Leonard Lake in this video. But he is living his best life while Charles Ng is serving his time. Why I believe Leonard corresponded with Charles is because they shared similar ideologies. But also, Leonard always knew that for this to work, it would need to be a lot more than him just kidnapping a woman and having this woman under his control. Something that we will speak about in part two is just about how administrative, in a way, this was. Even if you are thinking about survival, yes, now he is living off the benefits that he is getting from Donald and Charles. But, you know, would that be enough when the other person comes along? He needs somebody to hold guard, if nothing else. He needs help building this bunker. And who else can he entrust than the person that shares the same Sikh values with him? But also... And this is just heavily me speculating, having been born on the same date with a man. Scorpius don't really like other people owing them shit, but even more than that, we don't really like owing things to the others. And if you remember here, well, they're not kind of put Charles under the bus with that FBI raid. And you know what? Lannisters always pay their debts, and so do the lakes, as we'll learn the hard way. It was finally the prime time for Leonard to focus on survivalism. So, even when living still at Charles Gunner's house, he would start digging, like, in the backyards, in different areas of the city, digging up these holes where he would put, like, medicine or pictures or just, like, the essentials that he would need had shit come to shove. But then he decided, okay, this isn't the smartest. Like, people know me here. I need another area. He would move to Calaveras County, which is just near the Lake Tahoe, around 135 miles from Sierra Nevada, and just a bit further from San Francisco that he was at currently. And his life just settled into a routine. He would spend his weekends with cricket, during the week, he would be boring the drums of supplies in the hall on this location. And on the weekday mornings, he would be recording in his journals how successful or unsuccessful his search for Miranda was. He again would resort to different ads, whether offering women jobs or offering him photography sessions with him, obviously by now a professional photographer. So, by the end of 1983, Ng was in prison, corresponding with Lake. And Lake was on the outside, looking for a perfect Miranda, and looking for people that would make this dream come true, looking for people that will help him build this bunker. 
So if you are really thinking about busting the myth, as I said, I will be at the beginning of this episode, these people thought about this for decades. Next week, we're going to be talking about this, but in particular, Weed Lake, he sat on this for about 20 years, slowly putting pieces into action. Charles, a bit shorter period of time because he was younger, but pretty much a decade of these ideologies just forming in their brains, and then the two of them would meet, and these worlds would collide. In October 1983, just a week before his birthday, he sat on a couch in his new location in front of a camera. Good evening. It's Sunday, October 22nd, 23rd, something like that. Very close to my 38th birthday. And I'm starting this tape without script or without any real organization of what I want to say. But I do feel I need to explain. He went on to describe what the building that he is creating is going to be used for. The main emphasis of the building, the whole justification for its expense and its effort, will be a hidden portion, a secret room, if we can call it that, that will house a cell a jail cell, if you will. The purpose of that cell will be imprisonment of a young lady who probably at this moment is unknown to me. He described how he visualized this bunker. It would be designed not around the cell, but ultimately around the concept of a secret. Secure living place for myself and perhaps for friends. It would be a lie to say it was for anything other than primarily emphasizing the cell. And then, panting into the video camera microphone, he said, I can hardly wait. And that is where we are leaving it off with part one. Charles Ng still in jail and Leonard Lake ready to create his own bunker. Ready finally, after decades, for Operation Miranda after so many dumbass operation names. I wish I knew them all, but he didn't even bother to note some of them in the journals. Why do you wish to know them all? Why is this story so, like, captivating and so messed up? So, as I mentioned, part two will be with you in the next couple of days. And until then, I could go shower this nonsense off me and stop thinking about the fact that this man was born on the exact same date as me. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He wasn't born like same hour, same year. That would be the creepiest. That would literally be like, I'm not even into horoscopes. I'm not even into zodiac signs, but don't mess with me like these people. No, first check the birthday and then fill out the case suggestion form, okay? Let's, let's, let's figure that out. So I'm gonna leave you a couple of outtakes in which I totally don't speak about how much this bothers me and compare this thinking and rationale with my own. And I should be seeing you in a couple of days. Oh, bye. Bye. <laughs> the back is like, I got to get scoliosis. Okay, <laughs> they don't care. This story is going to change that opinion. It's going to push it right out of the way. <laughs> now thinking about it, this old guy. <laughs> I saw so it noise, but it's dying. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm failing as a plant owner. <laughs> the poor kid's gonna die. Wait, this is like, I am far as shit to at least see the space jump. <laughs> Why am I so far? <laughs> I legitimately cannot see at this distance. <laughs> yeah, but then the glasses wouldn't look like decent with a freaking ring light. Okay, first world problems, get it together. <laughs> okay, stop whispering, let's like test this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Is this mic so many times? Why are we still testing it? Because you can never reach true perfection. Actually, people have, Maya. A lot of people have, at least on like the sound, the visuals. Not you, though. <laughs> okay, cool. 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 We good? Uh, you are actually pushing it today with freaking Hogwarts behind you. Is this like a mandrake? Whoever designed this is actually pushing it. Like, why would they be standing next to a mandrake that famously screech and make noisy sounds? Are you gonna nerd out on Hogwarts right now? In the middle of this story. Sick. 
love it, love that for you. <laughs> this is a test. In 2021, one girl decided to take her YouTube journey seriously. She can't even put makeup on on the pimple that possessed her face. Can she nail her microphone sound? This is the story of Maya Mabengeza. Okay, let's see what this sounds like. <laughs> Ineptitude, that's what that sounded like. Ineptitude. Why are my shirts? It's like a cool logo. I'm not thinking of fucking I put it there so it looks like it's fucking attached to your neck. Yeah, that will convince people. <laughs> That's how the shirt looks. Like. Make sure. You put it like right there. <laughs> Could not turn into jeans by accident. You got like a shirt that's larger than like twice your size. I just... I don't know what my body looks like no more. Okay. Cool. Great conclusions. Great conclusions. Are you okay? Microphone. Are you okay with the high pitch? Now high pitch? Now like get excited about the topic. Like, oh my god, fetishes. Like, he was spanked as a child. <laughs> Don't spank your children. Okay, yeah, that's definitely gonna be... <laughs> the highlight point of this episode here which just goes out like don't spank them not because of like moral reasons because they're gonna develop the fetishes for example what chester will remember later is leonard having this chemistry lab so you're thinking okay this is great like he might be a young genius little young bill nye little young einstein like he's gonna be like doing all this hocus pocus shit why are you such a weird goofy boy? Silly goofy mood today. Start that sentence from the beginning. Shut it up. Shut it. Stop. Who is gonna listen to this story? You have, you have been like going on like some two plus speed from the get go. Cut down on campaign. Speak slower. Move on. In particular, during this time when he was using goat as a pick up technically towards his girls, really Leonard's true colors came out. He was different in loads of these different situations with women. Sometimes it would just be casual sex. Sometimes he actually took pictures of this woman with that one horned goat. Who deformed this goat? What has a goat done to you to actually genetically deform it so it looks like a unicorn? Like, this doesn't make no sense. It's stupid. Was everybody on drugs in the 1780s? Well, people in this story certainly were, but like, was everybody on drugs? Nudist parties, walking around naked, like, with your butt just showing in your house. If consensual, perfect. High five. Amazing lifestyle. I, w I would have been his friend, like, the, the non-creepy way. How would you make that not creepy, Maya? 39-year-old man and you were young, you, like, naked. How would that be not creepy? <laughs> but, you know, I support nudism. That is the point that I'm trying to make. No, listen, listen. Scorpios are famous for their control of their anger management issues. We are... We are cool as cucumbers. We are so chill. We are so relaxed. Like, he literally threatened at any site of inconvenience. He would be like, I'll blow this place up. I'm gonna squeeze my cyanide pill in my teeth. Like, sure, go ahead, me. Like, whatever. Just please leave this village. Please leave the premises. What I hate most about both of these cunts is how impressionable they are at the age when they really shouldn't be so impressionable. He's 18 and he's like, I used to collect mice and now I'm gonna start collecting women. Like, how did the two connect? Just because you read a book. Like, imagine me being like, read Fifty Shades of Grey and be like, every man is Christian Grey. Mm -hmm. There's every single man. All men are like this. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't make sense, man, for you to be this impressionable at this age. And the other one is like freaking pretending like he's Bruce Lee at like his grown ass man asking people to fight him. <laughs> Yet again, if this story wasn't about crime, it would have been great for a comedy skit. But here we are, so let's move on. Side note, don't beat your children, not because they're gonna be sitting and seeding and like hating you, but especially don't beat Scorpios up. And especially if, if you realize like they don't dislike it 100%. Because trust me, they're gonna grow up. And develop some weird ass fetishes, listen. <laughs> not a personal respect, personal experience. Don't do it. Do not do it. And that, because then you're gonna be in the back of their head. Then you're gonna be like, why? What kind of what kind of psychology is this? Why did you beat me in the first place? If you didn't, I wouldn't be a kinky ass bitch. <laughs> no, I'm 
blame, always blame it on your parents. Always fuck them, yeah. Or because it will mentally fuck them up, okay? If your kids are normal and not like sexual deviants, then it will just mentally fuck them up. Stop with your kids. Okay, no, that, that is done. The parenting lesson from somebody who's definitely not a parent. Okay, move on. 